So we're going to start because we want to make sure we give her as much time as possible. Um, for those of you not in the Media Foundations course right now, my name is Lisa Tobias and I am a senior lecturer here in the Department of Advertising and Public Relations. Today's event is brought to us through an endowment called the Gwen David Endowment and uh, her family, Gwen's family, is here so we want to give them a, a warm welcome, please. <laughs> Absolutely. Gwen was uh, a UT Longhorn grad in 1979 from the Department of Advertising as well. Um, she went on to become a, a Senior Vice President and Media Director at GSDNM just down the way. And this endowment was set up in her memory to um, recognize achievement in new media and in innovation. And so for that reason, um, this year we have a speaker here to talk to you guys. Her name is Shema Hyder, and she is going to visit with you guys about um, what she does, and that is she is a CEO of her own company. Um, it is called the Marketing Zen Group, and she has been recognized by many organizations, including Forbes and uh, Fast Company, as an award-winning publisher, author, um, overall amazing person. And um, she's going to chat with you guys about new media. And something else I want to tell you about her before I give the mic over to her is that she is also a Longhorn grad. Um, so she's an alum um, in 2000. Yeah, here we go. So in 2006, she got her undergrad and then her master's in 2008 from our Com Studies department here in Moody. So she's not only a Longhorn, she's a Moody grad. So welcome to our guest speaker. Thank you. Thanks. Good afternoon, everyone. How exciting to be here. Uh, great to be back in school in this way. And uh, thanks for coming here. I know some of you guys were doing homework for your next class, which I totally understand. So I appreciate you taking a break from that. <laughs> Because uh, I've been in your, your place, but I'm excited. You know, this, our a new media world is changing, and I'm hoping this is more interactive. So not like, you know, some of, some of your lectures, perhaps, where you have to wait till office hours to have questions. I'm going to save some time towards the end. So if you guys do have some thoughts, I'm happy to, to engage in that way. So it's so good to be here because, as mentioned in, in the gracious introduction, I did graduated from, I graduated from UT in 2006 with my bachelor's in communication studies. And then I continued on to my master's. I have a master's in, I think it's called Organizational Communication and Technology now. So, so great, uh, great program. And obviously, I, I love being back on campus. And you guys are so lucky. This is such a neat building and program. So thrilled to talk a little bit. You know, I'll give you a little bit of background on myself just because I get a lot of questions on that, sort of how I got started. And uh, then I will talk about new media, marketing, how I feel like it's really changed. And I'll give you my perspective because you know, I, I'm doing this from the trenches. I'm not that much older than you guys, and it's, it's a fascinating world out there. So I'm happy to share that perspective as well. So, you know, when I graduated UT, it was a very interesting time, and you'll find that I'm very candid about my life and my story and, and sort of how I ended up. Um, this was about uh, eight, so eight, nine, almost nine years ago when I graduated. And uh, when I did my master's thesis, and my graduate advisor is in the room, so shout out to Donna Ballard. Which, by the way, the best advice I can give you while you're in school, if you can take a class with Donna, do it. <laughs> it's the best advice I can give you. It's like, uh, it'll change your life, I promise. Um, but aside from that, so I did my master's thesis, and, and Donna was great. I was very lucky because you know, I was interested in communication, but I was also really interested in technology. Right? And today, we obviously have the new media center, and, and stuff looks a little bit different for you guys, which is awesome. But I think in that way, Donna and I kind of had to finesse our way into, <laughs> into studying that at the time. And so I looked at, you know, I looked at social media specifically as part of my thesis and part of my grad work, and looked at why people use that. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. And then the funny thing was, as I graduated, I had a very hard time finding a job in the field. Any guesses as to why? Yeah, that's a really good point. There was definitely a recession, so the economy wasn't doing so fabulous. Any other reasons that you can guess that might be that might have been challenging? Yeah, that's interesting. There were no positions, but you have to think about it. The industry didn't exist, right? So if you really think about eight, nine years ago, there was no Snapchat. How many of you guys use Snapchat? Okay, there was none of that, right? There's no Instagram. 
iPhones didn't exist like you know it now. I mean, the whole world looked very different. So when I went outside and, and thought I would get a job in social media, there were no jobs. That industry was so new. People said, what's Twitter? <laughs> they said, Facebook's for my 13-year-old. They didn't really, like, people didn't understand the la landscape as I think they do now, which is awesome for you guys, right? Because there's, that industry's come a long way. But when I was getting started, there really wasn't anything that spoke to me that I wanted to do. So I started my own company uh, with a lot of the encouragement of Donna and my other professors. And, and the school here said, you know, follow sort of, I think what's neat about being in communication studies, which was fascinating to me, I'm probably one of the, also the only students at UT who, who transferred from McCombs into communication studies. And I think it's, it's the best decision. I never regretted it. And a lot of people said, oh, but like McCombs, right? Like it's business school if you want to go in the business world. Not true. So you go into the business world, you don't need a business degree. You need a business education that you can certainly get outside of school as well. But you really need to do, when you're in school, I think is to sort of follow your passion, right? Find ways in, in which you feel like you can really add value to the world. And for me, that was always sort of communication and technology and, and, and things like that. So what I find fascinating about the degree that you're in and the world that you're in in marketing and media is even from three, four years from now, as we're talking about the future of stuff, there may be jobs that aren't even, they don't even exist today. Right? Think about it. It's someone's job out there today to create Snapchat filters. That job didn't exist, <laughs> right? Like two years ago, three years ago. It's all these things. Or how many of you guys use Bitmoji? It's someone's job, a whole team's job, to come up with Bitmojis for people. So you know, we think, oh, like that's funny, but like millions of people use that, right? So it's really cool to be in this field, and I'll talk a little bit about, more about social media. So I graduated, I was 22 when I got out of grad school, and I started my own company. I figured if there weren't any jobs, I was gonna sort of create it and see where that led. And you know, we were really lucky in that sometimes your audience, it's not your idea that's wrong, but you need to refocus on the audience. And what I mean by that is, when I graduated, I thought, you know, my job would be with a big corporation. That I would work with like the McKinsey's or the Bain's. I was very interesting in interested in consulting. But oddly enough, with those big companies, especially during recession times, as someone mentioned astutely, you, they don't want to do a lot of new stuff. A lot of times you'll find that big companies pull back because they don't want to be, you know, they want to take risks. But what I found was small businesses were really eager. So where big companies said, no, we don't want to do anything risky, right? Times are challenging. Small businesses said, hey, times are challenging, but if this brings people in the door, we'll try it. So some of our first businesses, clients, were small businesses. And so really at 22, 23, here I am starting my own company. I never had a regular job, right? That's, uh, it's, so that was my first job. I'm happy to share some of my lessons to, through that journey. But we grew very quickly. So we grew from the small business clients to we work today with a variety of different clients. Chase Business is a client of ours, Mary Kay, the cosmetics company, DFW Airport. So we have an amazing large variety of clients. I've got about, our team is about 30 people now all over the US. And so we, we grew very quickly. And part of that was embracing sort of, you know, where social media was going. And so a lot of times what you'll have to do is if you have a thesis, if you have a hypothesis, or you feel like the world is going a certain way, you'll find that sometimes you have to fight for that a little bit. You know, improve your value, improve your ideas. And on the flip side of that, you have to be very careful to make sure that you can also pivot your ideas very quickly if you feel like, I think this is great, but there's not necessarily market demand for that. So it's kind of this combination. So I think, you know, just, and I, by the way, I use marketing, media, all these terms really loosely, because I think they're so interrelated. You know, we used to think about advertising as a discipline, marketing, communications. Uh, but I hear that our, the dean is um, a fan of saying communication is the bridge that connects everything now, right? And so and I, I think that's such an apt analogy and metaphor because the world really is changing in, in exciting times. So let's talk about what is social media. I want to get you guys to redefine it a little bit. You know, the traditional definition is what you're probably all familiar with. So how many of you think when I say social media, things like Snapchat, how about Instagram, YouTube, Right? These are kind of things that you think about when I talk about social media. Totally fair. So one definition of social media is where people connect, communicate, collaborate. That is a definition for, for traditional social media. But there is a bigger definition that I would really encourage everyone in here to start thinking about. And that's the idea that 
people are now the media. Okay, so let that sink in for just a second. People are now the media. So social media isn't so much about platforms. People think about like the Snapchats and the Instagrams, but those come and go. You know, the question that I think I guess asked more, most often, I get asked most often is, hey, what's going to be here tomorrow, Shema? What's like the next hot thing? What's going to be trendy? And I tell them, you know what, I don't know what the next thing is, but I can tell you there will be a next thing. Because there always is. That's just the process of, of technology in the world. How many of you guys even remember Lycos in here? Anybody remember Lycos, the search engine? Wow, OK. Really? <laughs> all right. But like GeoCities, you know, it's funny because all these sites used to be kind of huge. Ask Jeeves, it was like a butler search engine. That sir, I always thought that was a cute concept. Like, I want a butler giving me my answers. That's kind of cool. Anyways, Google didn't run with that. But, um, but it's fascinating to think, you know, all these things that we thought were kind of so, or AOL, Yahoo, or AOL. People were like, yes, AIM. How many for you was like AIM the first kind of messenger, what you started using? And then, you know, things progressed. So everything changes. So Snapchat's here today. Something else is going to be here tomorrow. But this idea of how we sort of make decisions, how we're influenced now, how we gather data, how we make purchases, all of these things are very, very social media driven. It's this idea that people are the media. And I'll prove it to you guys. All right. How many of you, show of hands, right, have yelped the restaurant before trying it? Okay. How many of you have looked at a Rotten Tomatoes review for a movie before deciding what you're going to go see? If you look around, you'll see that almost all of us raised our hands, except those who are working on next class's homework, which <laughs> I get it. Guys, I've been there. It's cool. Um, but it's true, isn't it? If you looked around, that is the power of social media. This idea that how we make decisions, right? Movies, I mean, they determine their success or not at the box office long before it's released because of what people are saying, how people make purchases. How many of you guys have asked your friends or for feedback on social? for what you should get or what you should do. Everything from, hey, I'm thinking about you know, this, what classes to take, or I'm thinking about buying a car, whatever it may be. We turn to that all the time, but we don't necessarily think about that, right? Because you're like, well, I'm asking my friends, but where are you actually asking them on? Or you're getting all this data, and so you look at things like Yelp and Rotten Tomatoes and all these things, and that's all social media. That's all social media. And I won't play this video for you guys, but I think it's really interesting because there's a whole generation, right, that even as is coming up, even beyond us in this room, so you're talking about Gen Z, and what I love about, anybody have siblings that are Gen Z or kids in your family? Okay, so you'll find that they're even more technologically ahead, right, than us, which is amazing. I find, like, kids now, you know, like four years old, I have a friend who has a son who's four years old, and he waves his hand in front of the TV, and he's trying to get it to move screens. <laughs> like, he's not doing it to be cute. He's like, why won't this change the channel? <laughs> Um, but I love this video, and I, I won't play it for you guys, but it's this two-year-old who thinks that magazine is a broken iPad. Okay? And it's crazy because I don't know about you guys, but I still get a kick out of my technology. Like, I was just admiring Donna's iPad earlier, and I was like, this is so cool. Like, and it, to, you know, for me, technology is still a cool plus thing, but for, there's a whole generation now that's coming up where that's the norm. Right? And this little girl is adorable because she knows how to work an iPad just fine. In fact, I think in like pediatrician's offices, they're going to update the charts to be like six months. Are they swiping yet? <laughs> <laughs> like it's just an evolutionary thing. Like they get really, you know, like everybody needs to know how to do that. But what's great is she knows how to work the iPad beautifully. I mean, it's really kind of cool to watch a two-year-old work an iPad. And then her mom takes it away, gives her this magazine, and she's so confused. Like the pictures don't move, and she's trying to like, She's, she's just like, what did you give me? But because she's two, here's what she does, right? She's just figured out how to use her digits. She, so she tests her finger on the palm of her other hand to make sure her finger is still working. <laughs> Think about that. A whole generation that would first doubt their anatomy had given out, right? Because that's all they know. <laughs> like, that's the basic. Like, I know how to use my fingers. I know how to swipe. And, you know, so clearly maybe this thing is broken. Right? And we all kind of laugh and we're like, that's crazy. But think about how much that is our world now. You know, we talk about social media as something to use, but what I'm encouraging you to look at as you go further in your studies and go outside into the, into the real world is that technology and social media isn't something we use so much as the ecosystem that we live in. 
Right? This is just kind of how we make decisions and, and connect with people, and this is how we live our lives. It's a whole different thing to say, hey, how do we use this rather than we're actually immersed in it. Let's see if I can. So this is one of my favorite pictures, guys. 2005, 2013, same, same place, right? I think St. Petersburg Square. Um, what jumps out at you in the seven years, just out of curiosity? It's not exactly where's Waldo, right? <laughs> Pretty obvious. Like 2005, no devices. 2013, lots of devices. And by the way, I'm not, I haven't updated yet. I'm just waiting until 2018 until we all have Snapchat glasses. And I'm just going to get those. Kidding, kidding. Sorry, I didn't mean to scare you guys too much. <laughs> um, but what's great about this is if you look beyond the devices, beyond the obvious, OK, everyone's got technology. In 2005, what do you think is the reach of that event? What do you think is the reach? How many people do you think that event reached? Three, See, there's no wrong guesses. It's just a picture, guys. You're cool. Whoever was there, right? So maybe like 5,000 people. Maybe they went home and they told one other person. They told a neighbor. So maximum what? Maybe 10,000 people who kind of knew the event. How many people do you think 2013 reached? Millions, right? So part of what's really cool about being in marketing and communications right now is this ability to reach millions of people. Like that is a power humanity has never had before. Like I don't understand how people aren't always just high-fiving each other. <laughs> like, isn't this cool? Like I, I'm really pumped, obviously, about this stuff. But amazing, never in our history have we had such an crazy ability to be able to connect with people, to get a message out there. And I'll prove it to you guys too. How many of you, raise your hand, listen closely, how many of you don't know what happened on a recent United Airlines flight? One. OK? Anybody not know what happened on the flight? Does anybody know what I'm talking about that happened on the flight? Right, where that guy was dragged off the plane and it was everywhere. And what the crazy thing is, think about the actual event. How many people witnessed that actual event? The people on the plane, maybe the people around the seats, right? So like six people. Because, I mean, everyone is like, you don't really know what's happening three aisles, right? You're like in your little cocoon. So really, honestly, maybe six people actually knew what happened. But by the next day, almost everyone in the world knew what had happened. I'm not saying that's necessarily the objective truth, right? We, that's obviously why we have filters. And by the way, what I also think is a great skill set to sort of cultivate while you're in school is being able to separate the noise from the signal. Because there is, there's so much noise coming at you, it's good to figure out how are you, what's sort of your metric for knowing the truth. And it's really on you, you know, that responsibility, I think, in, in the world today is on you to figure out what's truth and what's, you know, fiction. But I think that's fascinating, just this world that we live in. And so marketing and social, all of these things, it's this idea that people are the media. And how are you going to leverage this? How are you going to leverage this in your careers, the companies that you work for, the companies you start? You know, one of the things that I find fascinating is I don't, as I was going through school, and I feel like this is true of the education system entirely, not talking about just at UT, you know, the system is often geared towards getting people into jobs, into careers, and it's very traditional, and it works for a lot of people. There's a reason that system exists. But I feel like entrepreneurship is also a path that is more and more likely for a lot of us, a lot of you guys in this room, just because you're in a field where what you want to do may not exist yet, which is an amazing thing, also terrifying, right, in some ways, but also pretty cool. So I think what's neat about being in this program in communication and in this field is that you have so many choices. You have so many choices in, in how you sort of cultivate your career. And I know this isn't supposed to be like a career advice talk, but I do think that's important because just like when I was at school, I feel like something that I did that was very helpful for me as a student was I created my own curriculum in a way. And what I mean by that is not that school doesn't give you great options and you have coursework, but I really, you know, it's amazing what happens when you ask questions and you get permission. Like when I was in school, I know they limited you to like 15 or 18 hours, but I was like, well, what if I want to take more hours? You know, I wanted to take a class at ACC because there's a fascinating subject I wanted to to learn, 
And they said, well, you can, but you have to get permission for it. And I was like, oh, okay, I just have to get someone to sign off and say I can handle it. Great. And I did. But so, so many times there's going to be things where you ask questions, and you're not going to know the answer until you ask questions, until you explore. So just like your career is your responsibility and what you make of it, even your education is your responsibility, not just to show up to class and get the grades, but to create sort of the curriculum that is going to help you be a better, well-rounded person when you get out there. So sorry, not here for the career spiel, but I do think it's interesting, right, from, from, uh, from where you guys are and, and hopefully helpful. So here's just a couple of things about our generation, millennials, which is 18 to 35, big driving force. Do you know that millennials, and I know that's not our favorite term to use, digital natives, whatever you want to call it, right? We will make up the majority of the workforce by 2020. By 2020. So that's crazy if you think about what that means for technological advancement, how people make decisions. By 2020, the majority of the workforce will not have learned technology on the job or something later. It'll be something they bring with them. It'll be something all of us bring with us. I mean, that's a huge, it's really interesting. It's a responsibility too. So just a couple of things I wanted to share that I think are fascinating about the generation. And I use this interchangeably, guys, because obviously you're in here. I'm talking about millennials, and you fall into that bucket. But this is also interesting to know, because if you're in communication, if you're marketing, this is going to be a lot of your audience. right? So this generation, us, is going to be more educated than any other generation in history, which means we ask a lot more questions. We tend to be more skeptical. Right? So any kind of marketing campaign, the things that you look at today need a component of that education, a component of, of being able to educate people. And then millennials are richer than Gen X. So in fact, out of North America, everyone who holds more than $2 million of net worth, 14% of that is actually controlled by millennials. Yay us. <laughs> Which is interesting because a lot of the media you look at and share is kind of like the student loan issues. And that's not to say those aren't challenges and that we're not a very diverse group of people. But it does mean that we have more power in numbers and buying power than the media necessarily gives it credit for. And of course, being socially savvy, which I don't think is just a generational thing, but I think in terms of not just technologically savvy, but let me ask a question. How many of you guys find it important to sort of give back or philanthropy is something you think about, like the company that you want to work for, whatever. How many of you volunteer or gives, do something to give back? Which, by the way, is awesome. You know, that's, that's fantastic, but that's definitely a newer trend, too. Not that we didn't have people who volunteered or gave back, but how integrated that is into people's lives today. And I think that makes a huge difference as well. All right, so three big trends I want to share with you, and we'll open it up to, to Q&A in social media. So what's, what's changing? And remember, I told you to think about social media not in terms of platform, right? But this broader, like people are the media concept. All right. So the first thing you have to realize about social media is that it's an identity-based ecosystem. Huh? What do you mean by that? All right. So what I mean by an identity-based ecosystem, I guess I can leave this picture up there, is do you remember how I told you guys that I did my thesis and part of that was looking at social media? Right, so one of the questions that I also explored while I was doing my grad studies was looking at why do people use social media? Have you ever wondered that? Like why people just shared, I had a banana for lunch? Right? We were just having that conversation. Like, or they're sharing like their 80th picture of their child for the day. Right? Like giving you the play by play. And you're like, wow, this is a lot. <laughs> OK, we've all seen it, right? People who share, and you, you wondered that. Now, how many of you have shared something and thought, like, why did I just share that? Right? On the flip side, we've all done it. We've all sort of been guilty because you're like making fun of people for taking selfies. And the next thing you're like, let's take a selfie. Right? So we're, we're, we're totally guilty of that. So it's like, why do we do that? And so part of me looking at this was exploring that because a part of being, I think, good at communications generally and marketing this new media field, if you will, is being able to almost understand the psychology of certain things. Why do people respond to what they respond to? understanding human behavior, um, which I, by the way, found really helpful to take some anthropology classes too. While I was an undergrad here, it just gave me you know, a more kind of diverse, I think, tool set for looking at some of these things. And so I thought it was to connect with other people. Would you say that's a fair hypothesis? Right? We want to have that sense of community to be able to connect with people. Totally fair. But I was wrong. That's the secondary reason people use social media. The primary reason people use social media is to showcase their own identity. 
And some of you are thinking, man, we're so narcissistic. How many of you are typing narcissistic? Hashtag. Okay. How many of you are editing a selfie right now? Just curious. Just kidding. No. Um, but what's fascinating about this isn't so much that we are narcissistic or the world really is a giant selfie. It's really so much more about that's how we as individuals have always figured out who we are. Identity is a changing construct, right? And especially, I think, as Americans, we like to think that we're really unique, like I'm so independent and I'm, you know, but really we're all sort of a product of the culture we live in, the families we grew up in, the friends we have. And think about this in terms of the first friend you made in kindergarten even. How did you make friends with someone who was sitting next to you? Chances are they used a blue crayon and you were like, I like blue crayons, right? And then you were having a PBG sandwich and they were like, get out of here. I love PBG sandwiches. And then it was like NSYNC or Justin Bieber or whatever. Like, as you get older, right, you find different ways of things to connect. Shows you how out of touch I am, by the way. <laughs> that was the closest thing I could think of. Wow. What's the big thing right now? It's not One Direction, right? It's like, like Taylor Swift. OK, I'm so uncool then. Because <laughs> I, <laughs> I totally have her album on repeat. All right, sorry. All right, you guys will have to educate me later on sort of what's cool so I can up my analogy game a little bit. All right, so people don't even say up my game anymore, do they? That's not a thing. OK, not a thing. All right, but so this idea of social media and why, how we create our identity, it's really important because then you look at marketing and how does this apply, right? So for the longest time, companies have always asked the question, what's our brand? What's our brand stand for? That's kind of like the big, everyone thinks about that, right, in the business world, like what's our brand stand for? But if you understand that people are using social media to showcase their own identity, it becomes the wrong question to ask, especially in advertising. The question really needs to be, what does doing business with us allow our customers to say about their personal brand? Do you see the shift? If people are using social media and marketing and like kind of media and how they're engaging, and it's less to do with connection and more to do with self-identity and self-reflection as a primary, then the things that you like, you do so because it says more about you than it does that one thing. Think about the things you think about the pages you like on Facebook or stuff that you interact with or things that you share. Even when you text your parents or you find something funny or whatever it may be, it's more because it says something about you, isn't it, than the actual thing? Now I'll give you a couple of examples. What does that look like to you guys, by the way, that picture? There's no wrong answer, it's not a prop quiz. Looks like a WeWork. Looks like a WeWork co-working space, great guess. Coffee shop, excellent. Restaurant, okay, very cool. Closing time at a restaurant. You got coffee shop, co-working space, closing at a restaurant. Any other guesses? A library. A library, great, yes. An office, okay, awesome. How many would guess that that's a bank? That's a bank. That is a bank. So. One of the things that Mass Mutual of all places thought about was, hey, banking's really changed, you think? <laughs> How many of you guys bank on your phones? Right? Mobile phones, Venmo, PayPal, like all the like we banking has changed. When was the last time you guys went into a bank to meet with a banker? Think about that. That is changing. That is changing very quickly. And banks are built based on the bank's brand. Right? Trust, security, stability, all these things. But a lot of what we're looking for isn't just those things, but convenience, right? efficiency, lower rates, whatever it may be. So the world of banking has really changed. So one of the things they asked was, let's not focus on us. Let's focus on our customers. What do our customers want, especially millennials? So you're thinking identity-based ecosystems. So they're thinking, what do millennials want? OK, how to buy your first house, maybe? How to pay off your student loan? how to finance your first car, how to travel maybe around the world with your best friend and be able to do it on a budget. Like, how do you finance for these things that are really exciting to you? And so they started these banks, and they call them Society for Grown-Ups, OK? Where it's not just a banking service, but it's these classes on exactly how to do these things. How to, it's financial literacy and education. So it's about putting their customers first. So a lot of this kind of new media, new marketing stuff is thinking about not just your brand and companies and things that you work with, 
but your audience, which also as a sidebar, some of the best advice I can give you when you are applying for jobs, when you get out of school, is make sure that you make it about the company and not about yourself, because everybody is pitching themselves, right? And how do you stand out? Pitch yourself by all means, you're trying to stand out, but take the time to maybe look at their website and say, you know what, I'm, this is totally a fresh perspective, take it for what it is, because you don't want to be arrogant about it, right? But you're applying because you obviously have value to add, so do it before you have the job. So you see, here's three things I saw very quickly. Whether you give me an interview or not, just wanted to share, you know, I hope that's helpful. That makes you stand out from everybody else who made it about themselves. Not about the company, not about the job, not about what you're bringing to the table. It's a very quick kind of switch if you think about to use in many different ways of life. This is another fun one. How many of you guys did the ice bucket challenge? Remember the ice bucket challenge where people dump buckets of ice water on their heads? So ALS did that, which, you know, it's, it's a noble cause, but it's a small cause. But look at that. In 2013, their donations are 1.7 million. In 2014, 11.4 million. All through an organic campaign. Why was that so successful? Any guesses? Why do you think that campaign was so successful? Yeah, absolutely. Social pressure. There's a like a virality component built in, right? And what gets people to actually engage? What got someone to dump buckets of ice on their head? Being able to post it. Being able to post it. Absolutely. Being able to share it. But it also said something about you if you did it, didn't it? That you were willing to be a little silly for a good cause. That you were willing to to tag you. That you were willing to tag your friends into doing something kind of fun, goofy, that it was really low pressure, wasn't it? Almost everyone's got a bucket and some ice water. That's not a huge ask. And they were able to tie that in to their bigger mission. So it's about, they could have just made it about ALS, but they would not have had that traction. But they made it about people and something that was neat that was still attached to the mission. It wasn't something totally random, right? There was a, a connection there. Um, but it was very successful for those reasons, and it did get people talking. This is an, a campaign that was started by uh, New York City, and it was really neat, and it was called I Will Listen. And so one in four Americans are impacted by mental illness. I think it's getting a lot of well-deserved attention, finally, that we're looking to solve some of those challenges. And this was really neat, because all they did was they had people who posted a quick video of themselves in New York City who said, hashtag, I will listen. If you are suffering from something, I commit to be there for you. Right? It was a very simple ask, but same thing. They got to tag their friends. They let people know that they were willing to listen. And it was a really good first step, and it was a very successful campaign. Again, are you guys seeing the theme here right? of being able to, as you engage people, as you influence what you're looking for? And it's very, very cool stuff. So the second big thing that we're looking at is, in terms of trends is this content curation and aggregation. So what is content curation and aggregation? What does that mean? All right, how many of you guys think we don't have enough information online? No one, right? How many of you feel that we're inundated with information? Yeah, there's a lot of information out there all the time. It's amazing. We're like, I mean, I still remember when you could surf the internet in a day. Does anybody else remember that? There were like 15 pages to the internet. Wow, I really do feel old. OK, thanks, guys. You could have just pretended for a minute. Just be like, of course. All right, so we've gone from this place where we were really information hungry to we still need information, but we need it within context, don't we? We need it within context. So for example, if you were trying to pick your classes for next semester and someone recommends like the classes you should really look at and you've got two weeks to turn in your selections, that's helpful, wouldn't you say so? Now let's say you're finishing that semester and someone's like, oh man, you should really take this class, except it's now ending. Is that helpful? No, it's spam, right? You're like, uh, thanks, that would have been helpful like at the beginning, right? Not helpful anymore, and I'm graduating, so thanks. So context changes everything. So part of what's happening in marketing and sort of this trend is it's not just important to have more information, but how you present it, how you curate information. So when I was starting my company and I had no clients, like literally 22 years old, $1,500, in a marketing, you know, in my business account or started my company with that. 
Um, I had my dog as my assistant, Snoopy. He's still around. He eats better treats, but that's really the big difference. And <laughs> Snoops wasn't very helpful. Great moral encouragement, though. But part of what, you know, as, as I was starting the companies, realized, what did I have to offer? Right? Because you have to bring value to the table. How was I going to prove that I knew what I was talking about? Well, luckily, there's a thing called blogs. <laughs> Right? So one of the first things I actually did was I started a marketing blog. And I thought, what am I going to write about? I don't feel like I know enough. right? And so some of you guys may feel that way. Like, where do I start? I'm not an expert at this. So one of the things that I actually started doing was I would read marketing books and put summaries of those books. That was like my very basic. And people loved it. They were like, oh, I've been meaning to read this forever. Thanks for, you know, thanks for the cliff notes. Right? Because the one thing I was good at was taking notes. Right? <laughs> School had gotten that down for me. And in fact, I would go to conferences. And some of the ways I got my first clients was I would take notes at the conference, the session. And then afterwards, I'd be like, does anybody want my like, amazing 15-page notes? And they'd be like, yeah. I'd be like, great. Give me your business card. <laughs> right? I'll send you my notes. And so like very pure, like, pure hustle, right? pure hustle to be able to share stuff and be able to. Be, and, and it was great. It was like the skill set I had, which was I was like, I'm really good at taking notes. I can summarize the heck out of this thing. Right? And so that's really kind of what I was utilizing. But part of curation and aggregation, I think, is a growing trend across the board. Anybody is familiar with Kiva? Right, a couple of you. Okay, so Kiva is really cool. It's a nonprofit. It's kiva.org if you guys want to check it out. And it's all about giving micro loans right, to p businesses around the world. But what Kiva does so well that other organizations, nonprofits often miss out on, is it really tells you the story. So you're not just giving 50 bucks to you know, some third world country, you might choose, you know, 50 bucks to give to these sisters in Cambodia who are growing more lotuses and they're using that money to send their kids to school. Right? Now you're giving to people. It puts, puts a face to that. Now it's not just random, like, hey, I'm giving something to some group out there. You feel a connection. You feel like you're actually contributing to this one thing. So Kiva does a great job curating these stories Right, which makes nonprofits so much more powerful. How many of you guys work with a nonprofit or add it, like have some affiliation to a nonprofit? All right, awesome. So one thing that you guys will find really helpful is they did a study and they looked at why do people not give to a nonprofit, right? People who've given online before, like that's not an issue. Like they're comfortable giving, that's not a problem. Why would they not give? And what they found is the number one reason people wouldn't give who otherwise would was they didn't feel that like their donation made a difference. Think about it. And that's a terrible reason because most of the stuff is like set up to do good, right? And make a difference. But the good news is by telling that story better, by better showcasing how that's being used, you have a chance of helping your nonprofits grow. This is also true on a leadership level, by the way. That is uh, Satya Nadella of Microsoft, which is really neat because he doesn't tweet a lot of original content, but he curates a lot of stuff. Here's the crazy thing, I think, also about leadership that's changing. You know, it meant to, what it meant to be a leader was that you had authority and it was really hard to get in touch with you. You had, like, it was, the harder it was to get access to you, the more important you were. Okay, this is true. Like, if you had to go through six assistants, like, Man, they were really important. You had six assistants that I, you know you had to go through. But today, leadership is very different. The more important you are, the more accessible you have to be to people. And I'll give you the perfect example. The other day, I was on LinkedIn, and all of a sudden, this video pops up, and it's Justin Trudeau, who's the Prime Minister of Canada, and he's like, "Hey guys, thanks so much for helping us reach a million people on LinkedIn." <laughs> and it was the coolest thing. He was like, "Let me know what Canada can do for you." <laughs> Right? And I was like, this is awesome. You're really cool. And, but what's neat is that is the expectation of leadership, I think, in terms of you know, how technology is changing and what we expect of our leaders, not just to be responsible and accountable, but to be accessible. Think about all the people you can pretty much tweet and get a response from. I'm not saying it's going to be a great response, <laughs> but I'm saying you can get a response, right? It's crazy, like, but it's also awesome that we live in that world now. And part of that is, is curation. So especially when you start out and you're building your professional brand, don't worry about so much about what am I going to come up with out of this head. Think about how you can be better curators of information. Upworthy, this is another one of my favorite sites. 
Anybody heard of Upworthy? It's one of the fastest growing sites right now. It's really cool. All they take, do is take really positive videos online. They give it a cool subject and they share. So they change up the headline because headline in advertising is what, 80% right, of, of being able to attract something. And they match it with good content. And so Upworthy is working because they curate. You could go to YouTube and see all the videos you want, right? But what's cool about Upworthy is that they only create, take positive content. So if you're looking for like a positive pick-me-up during the day, you're more likely to find it here than you will just trying to go to YouTube and finding something cool. So it's a curation engine. Kit, another one of my favorite things, it lets sort of um, people in different fields create their own kits. So like Martha Stewart has one for cooking, LeBron James has one for sports, and his includes like basketballs, right? And like where he gets his uh, sneakers, and people can purchase stuff that they like which is neat. I have one up here, and it's for how to, do your, how to start your own video channel. And so people would always ask me, like, what mic do you use? What cameras do you use? So I just set, set up a kit, which again, great example of a curation engine. How many of you guys like Pinterest, by the way? It's a pretty addictive site, right? So Pinterest is also a great example of a curation engine. It's not producing anything, but it helps you curate stuff, doesn't it? Helps you find things, helps you curate things. Right. The third big trend is this idea of video, how powerful online video is and how device agnostic it is. When was the last time you guys said, hey, I'm watching this video on television? That sounds like an odd statement on the ears too now, doesn't it? Because if you're watching a video, it could be anywhere. On your iPad, you might be watching it on your TV, who knows? But on your mobile phone, on your computer, but you just think about it as a video, don't you? You could be watching Netflix on your laptop and you switch to the TV, but the devices don't matter and online video is so ubiquitous and it's so powerful now. I'm a big fan and I think that's the future of a lot of things. And so I'll give you an example. I've, had, I've been doing live videos for, I don't know, like six years now. And I started on YouTube, switched it to Facebook. Facebook Live is very powerful. Now switched it to sort of LinkedIn because that's where a lot of my audience is. But what's crazy is, you know, especially with Facebook Live and live videos, and you may not know this, but li live streaming videos used to be a very expensive thing. Like it would take hundreds and thousands of dollars to be able to live stream video. And today it looks totally different because, right, like sites like Facebook and LinkedIn, they kind of take a lot of that burden from you, so it's so easy to live stream. But live streaming, I think, will continue to grow in not just its popularity, but use and now we're talking, even if we look like 10 years down the road, augmented reality, right, beyond virtual reality. So video gets more and more inclusive. And it's definitely, by the way, a skill set you should have some familiarity with, whether on front of camera or behind the camera, it doesn't matter. It's about learning how to create good content. I just wanted to show you guys this. Like, for example, Mary Kay is one of our clients. We did a live video for them. This was just a groundbreaking event for their new facility. Look at that up there, almost 600 people tuned in to watch dirt. Right, that's kind of what a groundbreaking is, it's dirt and a ribbon. But it's amazing because live video is getting so much more play in social media feeds too. Do you guys know like your Facebook feed and stuff like that? So if you do a live video, chances are it gets three times more visibility than any other type of content right now. So part of being in this field is also being agile and being able to pivot so when you say, hey, Videos are doing really well. Let's do more of this over here. And then tomorrow when a platform changes, you say, hey, you know what? Now we're getting a lot more traction with this type of content. Let's pivot and do this here. Because at the end of the day, your goals are pretty straightforward. It might be views, it might be leads, it might be sales, whatever it is from a marketing sales perspective. But how you go about it, those platforms are always changing. I think that's really exciting. And here's how everyone can be creative. Do you guys remember Pokemon Go and how crazy that was? So I love this because San Diego police did a PSA announcement of how to play Pokemon Go and be safe. And it was so much fun, but it was great press and visibility for them, right? Like San Diego Police Department doesn't get to talk about a lot of stuff except when it's really depressing or dangerous or bad. So this was a great way for the police department to get involved in something that was the community, still public safety, and it was a lot of fun. And and look at that, they had like 125,000 something views on just a PSA announcement that those things don't get more than like 1,000 views most times. But they were able to be creative. And I think 
part of what all of this is, is even as the platforms change, that creativity and the ability to create, that's not going away anytime soon. So part of what I'm encouraging you to do, of course, as school is meant to do, is to think differently about social media, about technology, heck, even your own career path about defining sort of what it means to you and how you're going to be able to use this really awesome era that we live in. All right, so that being said, I would love to open it up to questions. I think we want to walk. You guys have to walk to the mics, I think, because they're trying to record this. Yes, I'm saying that right. OK, so feel free to approach the podiums. OK, the mics, then, if you guys have a question. Oh, it's intimidating. Oh, come, guys. You're Longhorns. <laughs> Plus, it's good practice. I'm not that scary, right? My sister tells me I am, but I don't think so. That was just because she's younger. Hi. Hey, thanks for bringing our icebreaker. High Hi. five. Hi. Nice awesome. Meeting nice meeting you. OK. Yeah. OK, so you asked a lot of questions during your talk, which is probably like the majority of what you do is just like, asking like so many questions and like yes. seeing so much stuff so I'm kind of the same way and I get overwhelmed with like how much I want to know and yes. like where I should start so my question to you about questions <laughs> is where do you start when you have a question or like what's an interesting thing that you've learned about curiosity yeah so I that's such a that's such a, by the way great question Thank on you. questions like <laughs> way to be meta right cool um, <laughs> But what's awesome is, so in fourth grade, I won an award, and it was for the most curious. Okay, like, awesome. And that's still the award that I think I'm the most proud of, because okay. I feel like it, so I, I think curiosity, like everything else, is a muscle. Sure. The more you utilize it, the, the stronger it gets, but it also gets smarter, yeah. right? And what happens is, when you're just starting to be curious about something, it's kind of good to ask lots of questions. Mm -hmm. You kind of get, like, even when you're brainstorming, you're asking lots of things, because you don't know where the dots are going to connect just yeah. yet. Once you've done that, and then you have something that you're like, wow, this looks really interesting over here, then you can go deeper okay. into that, right? So yeah. for me, at least what works is I always start broad. Like, I want the breadth of everything. Mm -hmm. I want to have a broad understanding of how things work. And then when I kind of figure out, okay, I really like that, then I go a lot deeper okay, into cool. that. Do you, like, have a certain amount of time that you take for a question, or you just, like, allow yourself to go, like, naturally through the process? That's a great question, too. <laughs> no, this is great. We'll just sit here and do this. Welcome, guys. Okay. So the other, yeah, you know, it depends on the subject. Okay. It really does. And so sometimes for me, it's a natural process of exploring. Like, I guess this is the way I'll answer it. If it's a subject I know nothing about, mm -hmm. I find that asking really broad, silly, even something a three-year-old will ask yeah. would help me. And then I find if it's stuff that I really know well about, mm -hmm. then I'm asking more questions to help me get to a specific answer. Sure. If that's... Yeah. No, that helpful. does. It definitely but yeah, is. I mean, I used to keep journals, and mm -hmm. I would just write questions down mm -hmm. that I had because I think you learn so much more that way, yeah. right? Engaging. So yeah, I really don't think there are any stupid questions. Cool. I do think there are stupid ways of asking questions, yeah. <laughs> right? In yeah. the sense that, like, you know, if you can Google it, Google it, learn all you can on your own, and then go out and seek, right? Kind of the stuff that you couldn't figure out on your own. Sure. I think yeah. that's an important thing. That makes yeah. so much sense. Thank you Thank so you much. Thank you so much, yeah. guys. I really appreciate it. Feel free to take a picture of that, because I know you guys will have questions later. So you guys can tweet or send me an email um, or whatever. But this was, I really had a good time. I think we're, we have one more question over here. Yes. Hi. Yes. But right as it was starting, um, I think for a lot of people, one of our concerns going into the workforce is how to market a communications education, like how to make these soft skills into hard skills that are tangible things you can offer to a company to add yes. value. So what would you say to that point? Like how do you turn a communications education into Absolutely. marketable skills um, and like legitimizing your role as, a, yes. as someone in new media? Um, Can I give you a, a hi-fi too? A lot of traditional sweet. media. Sweet. Okay. Yay. Thanks. We're just okay. playing around out here. Yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. So, so, so awesome questions. And I will, I will tell you guys this. I used to think that communication was something everyone was good at. Like, it, I took it for granted. Boy, was I wrong. OK? Boy, was I wrong. Like, I can't tell you how many resumes I've gotten where I'm like, I wish they were a comm major. Because they're, it's so, they're so smart, but they can't communicate. Right? And especially when one of your first introductions is through the written, like, an email, something like that, you really, I mean, you, you can tell. As an employer, I can tell when someone has solid communication skills. And I will tell you, that is not a soft skill. That is a hard 
set skill. I will say finding ways to help improve that, right, to finesse that. So what I mean by that is like looking at analytics, right, that's more of a tangible, if you're thinking business-wise, like you guys who won that, congratulations, by the way, shout out to this group over here, but you guys did Google AdWords, right, with, with analytics, which is awesome because now, yes, you can communicate it, but you can also read data. Does that make sense? So I would say look at maybe statistics, different things that you don't have to be, I was never great at math, like that's not been my song, strong subject. I've always focused on my strengths, but I did, I did feel like I was educated enough where I could have a greater perspective, right? So, and that's what I mean by when you are going into a job too, even if the job title, you're like, I'm a communication studies major, that's not like, it might be, for example, to you know, be like a director at a nonprofit, right? And you feel really passionate about it, but you're like, man, I'm just getting out of school, you know, I'm, I'm a communications major, what do I do with that? Again, look at their website, think about as if it was a project for school, what value could you add? And I will tell you that I honestly don't care about someone's degree when they're applying. And we hire, by the way, interns all the time. We hire people all the time. What I look for is, do they bring value to the table? Are they sort of a go-getter? Are they willing to do whatever it takes? Like one of our VPs started out as an intern and he stalked me for three months until I gave him an internship. Like I'm not even kidding, like this kid, I was like, hey, I'm available for coffee this day, finally, you know, like after three emails that he'd sent to me, not to be rude, I'm just that, I was just that busy. The third email, I was like, hey, I can do coffee tomorrow. And he was like, yeah, great, I'll, I'll be there. And then later I found out he was in Houston, but he drove up because he didn't want to miss the chance, right, <laughs> to be able to come there. And so, and I told him, I was like, we're not looking for interns right now, we're full, and he's like, whatever, give me, I will go pick up like, dry cleaning coffee and it was just like we're not gonna make you do that but that's awesome that he was committed right he was showing that he was a team player and I was like okay three months into his internship almost every VP comes to me and they're like you gotta hire this guy like we will give parts of our salary you gotta bring this kid on board and so when you show that kind of commitment and value add and he didn't know about marketing this was his first agency experience he went to every department head and was like hey can I get you lunch like can you tell me how your department works, like this is really interesting. And then he would give them ideas, right? Like make himself useful even though he was an intern for that department. So honestly, and, and the sad, in a way the sad thing, but the good news is the bar is low. Most people will send that email, that cover letter resume and never follow up. I can't tell you how many times I tell someone, sorry, we don't have something, but keep in touch. That's not just lip service. I'm actually saying keep in touch because three months later we're like, who was that person who interned to be a content writer? Like, now we have an opening, where did they go? And we never heard from them again, right? So part of that is persistence, it's good old fashioned hard work, and making sure that you're constantly thinking about how to add value. And it has, doesn't have to, anything to do with your degree in communications. It just has to do with you being able to add value, and of course being able to articulate value. So one thing that I always tell people is, every project, think about it in three ways. Like as, you know, even if you ever start a company, whatever. Think about every project in three ways. Think about how you're gonna do the work. Think about then how you are going to showcase that you are doing the work. A lot of times people are really good with what they do, but they think they're just working behind their computer or whatever and their boss should take notice. This doesn't mean you have to go bragging about like, man, I sit in the office late again today, but it is about being smart and saying, hey, just so you know, here's, here's what I'm working on, right? Or like, even if you use something like Slack, being available on Slack, it's little things that showcase that you're available, that you're accessible, that you're, here's what I'm doing. So you, especially if you work for a big company, it's like, what's that guy do again? Right? Making, that's on you. And the third thing is making sure that every success you have, how do you leverage that to get further in your career? And so one of the tips that I gave these guys over here was, you know, when they won that award and they have a case study now, how they've helped a real company, add that to your resume, even as an attachment, saying, by the way, I worked on this case study, I think some similar principles could be applied here, wanted to share it, right? Already puts you heads and shoulders above other people. So hopefully that's helpful. All right. Thank you so much. Thanks, guys. You've been great. <laughs>